Hi, hello, and welcome to the Word. There are very few denominations today who can claim to have a prophet who was born outside of the time of the Bible. I have done a study on two modern-day prophets, giving much detail of their beginnings and the role they played in their denominations. What we do know, however, is that they are both called cults. I always ask, are these labels warranted? Are they fair? In 2008, Dr. George Knight gave a lecture comparing the two prophets and the misuse of one. Today, we will take a look at whether this lecture validates a point I have been making for some time now. Ready to study? Let's get started. Since this is a recording, I will play a certain amount of sound bites, then I will discuss. And I don't have to tell you that the study does not belong to me and that I had no part in its production. Again, in this case, I am just a messenger. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has eyes, let him see. But he who chooses to remain blind, suit yourself. As I said, the study is en route to some other studies. Ezekiel 9, um, the wheat and the tears. If you have not seen the study before this one on Zechariah 4, I suggest that you do so right now before you continue. Also, there will be no biblical passages in this study, so don't be disappointed when you find out that there is none. But before we get into the meat of the matter, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your blessings of a new day. So much has happened today that were it not for your grace, we would not have been alive. I want to personally thank you for all the things that you have afforded me, these blessings of sight and mental health, just to be able to breathe freely. We pray for those who are in recovery of any illnesses, and we empathize with those grieving after the loss of a loved one. Now take us through this study in peace and safety, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us begin by listening. Well, some years ago, we had a general conference president, not the current president, who used to send out weekly a a, a news sheet. Uh, Actually, it wasn't a news sheet. It was kind of a little statement that he wanted to make for the week. And I'll never forget the week that it came through. And it said something like, we really can't understand Adventism without Ellen White. I was so upset because I believe that Adventism is scriptural. Otherwise, you couldn't do evangelism. And I was so upset that I went into my class. There was about 70 students sitting there. And I said, the general conference president is sounding more like a Mormon every day. And I was thinking that the Mormons, you know, they have to get their doctrine from Joseph Smith. Well, I uh, probably said a little more than that. And after class, one of the students went out and phoned up Silver Spring, Maryland. (laughs) And the next day, I got a call from the General Conference office, not the President's office, but the Review and Herald, Adventist Review. And they, they asked me if I would do an article on Ellen White and Joseph Smith but to please leave the president out of it. (laughs) And so that uh, started a journey. Ellen White and Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, have a great deal in common. For one thing, they both claimed the prophetic gift. For another, the year 1844 was significant in their lives. For Ellen White, it was the year of her first vision. For Joseph Smith, it was the year he met his death at the hands of a mob at the Carthage, Illinois jail. 
Another similarity is that both reader, leaders had a concern for the soon coming of Jesus. That concern is reflected in the titles of the religious movements they helped to found. Seventh-day Adventists and Latter-day Saints. But with those two rather superficial likenesses, the similarities between these two 19th century religious leaders ceases. At the deeper level of their teachings, they are diametrically opposed in much that they stood for. Let's take, for example, their prophetic ministries as they relate to the Bible and doctrine. So he is saying here that his journey into the research was based on a statement by the then president that Adventism cannot be understood without Ellen White. He was also asked to write an article on the two prophets. He, however, gives the similarities and the differences. For Ellen White, the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments were the sum total of Scripture. The biblical canon had been closed with the book of Revelation. The Bible in the eyes of Ellen White was all that was needed for salvation. Now, don't tell that to some Adventists, but it's true. Thus, she could write to her fellow Adventist believers from the Fifth Testimonies, if you had made God's word your study, you would not have needed the testimonies. Again, page 663 from 5T, she saw her prophetic function as one of bringing people back to the word that they have neglected to follow. Another, on another occasion, she penned that little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light, her writings, to lead men and women to the greater light, the Bible. Over and over, Ellen White pounded home such themes, her career centered on pointing Adventist believers back to the Bible and its principles as the source of of authority for Christians. So we see that he makes a comparison of the two, then branches off into the diametrical oppositions. Since the Mormons believe in the book of the Mormons, which is like a repetition of some gospel writers and some other stuff, to the people who lived in America many years, we can see the difference. So to make the distinct point that Ellen White believed only in the Bible and no other sources he quoted from Testimonies, Volume 5. If I am to go a little further, the subheading under which he took that quote is not to take the place of the Bible. That the testimonies were not given to take the place of the Bible. The following extract from a testimony published in 1876 will show. Brother J would confuse the mind by seeking to make it appear that the light God has given through the testimonies is an addition to the word of God. But in this, he presents the matter in a false light. God has seen fit in this manner to bring the minds of his people to his word to give them a clearer understanding of it. The word of God is sufficient to enlighten the most beclouded mind and may be understood by those who have any desire to understand it. But notwithstanding all this, some who profess to make the word of God their study are found living in direct opposition to its plainest teachings. Then, to leave men and women without excuse, God gives plain and pointed testimonies, bringing them back to the word that they have neglected to follow. The word of God abounds in general principles for the formation of correct habits of living. And the testimonies, general and personal, have been calculated to call their attention more especially to these principles. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, 323. Now, if we dissect that properly, we would understand that testimonies here means counsels to the church, not doctrines. So, for example, men are, uh, are reading from the word of God that they must not commit adultery. But while reading the word, they are practicing such and still function in the church. God gives her the counsels to rebuke them and correct them to know that they can't read the word and live opposite to it. So in such a case, the testimonies that were given to her was to direct them to obey the scriptures. This is why they are called testimonies. 
This is where these words are now fused and confused. So when we hear the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, this finds a new meaning by saying the testimonies is based on the gift of prophecy in the person of Ellen White. So the SDA church um, is the church of revelation because we have the spirit of prophecy books, which include the testimonies. She continues. If you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard and attain to Christian perfection, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourselves with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple direct testimonies, calling your attention to the words of inspiration which you had neglected to obey and urging you to fashion your lives in accordance with its pure and elevated teachings. So what do I need to tell you? to convince you that I don't have to read one iota of Ellen White as long as I am studying the Bible and practicing what it teaches. The testimonies are for those who do not acquaint themselves with the Word of God. Please note that this here is not about doctrines again. These testimonies are about Christian behavior. Such a position is in radical discontinuity with that of Ellen White in the early Seventh-day Adventist Church. According to Ellen White, the Bible is the only rule of faith and doctrine. Again, when detractors in 1874 suggested that the Adventists had obtained their sanctuary doctrine from Ellen White's visions, Uriah Smith was able to truthfully write in 1874, and I quote that hundreds of articles have been written on that subject, but in not one of these are the visions once referred to, and this is 1874, as to any authority on the subject or the source from which any view we hold has been derived. The appeal is invariably to the Bible where there is abundant evidence for the views we hold on this subject, end quote. Early Seventh-day Adventists were a people of the book. Historical study demonstrates that each of the distinctive doctrines developed by the Adventist pioneers in the 1840s and 50s was developed and argued on the basis of Scripture. Ellen White's role was one of confirmation rather than origination for Adventist theology. Ellen White's role was confirmation rather than origination for Adventist theology. Do you understand that statement? The doctrines of the Adventist church came about by studies, not Ellen White. However, after they were finished and finalized the studies, they were capped and closed by Ellen White, obviously after a vision. Now, what that means is anyone who challenges any doctrine of the church automatically challenged Ellen White and challenges the authority of God's inspiration. Let's just be honest on this right away. There is a great gulf fixed between Ellen White and Joseph Smith, between Adventism and Mormonism. The tragedy for Adventists, however, is that when we forget our heritage, we forget the facts of our faith and history. When we think that we cannot understand our doctrine or, or the Bible without Ellen White's aid. Ellen White's prophetic ministry to the Adventist church is of crucial importance. But when she is placed where she's asked us not to place her writings, we have stepped off the platform of Adventism and on to the platform of Mormonism. Yet, that is just what too many Seventh-day Adventists have done. Don't miss this point he just made. When we step off the platform of where she told us not to place her, we have stepped off Adventism and walked into Mormonism. Pause and digest this. This man is making a serious point. Let me make the point. If you consider Mormonism to be cultish and false, for that stance, Adventism falls under the same bracket. That belief has had a major impact on the Mormon approach to doctrinal development. As modern, uh, Mormon scholar Stephen E. Robinson puts it, the visions and revelations of Joseph Smith, and I'm quoting, form the foundation of Latter-day Saints doctrine. For Latter-day Saints, the highest authority in religious matters is continuing revelation from God given through the living apostles and prophets of his church. 
beginning with Joseph Smith and continuing to the present leadership. Now take note of what you just heard. The Mormons believe in continuing inspiration of Joseph Smith and others. So the Bible books are not closed. God still gives more revealed truth to the church. Whereas Ellen White repeatedly says there is nothing new. Whatever we call new is the same old teachings of the scripture. But the Bible and the Bible only. Too many Adventists use Ellen White in a sectarian way. A position she herself rejected. Less, somewhat less than two years ago, I was asked to go to Brigham Young University, the intellectual center of Mormonism, to present a paper on Ellen White and her relationship to Scripture. It was a high-level conference. There were leading evangelicals. There were mainline Episcopalians, Roman Catholic Archbishop, Orthodox scholars, and of course, a large contingent of Mormon scholars. This is going to be an historical tour of how we have related Ellen White to the Bible throughout our history. And I think it will be informative. By the way, this is the paper I read at Brigham Young. One of the participants, by the way, was David Neff, editor of Christianity Today, ex-Adventist minister, and uh, a good thinker. By what authority? That is always an interesting question, but it is doubly so in a Christian movement that believes in the authority of Scripture, but also claims to have an inspired prophet as one of its founders. Such is the situation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which according to its current statement of fundamental beliefs, holds that the Word of God in the Bible contains the knowledge necessary for salvation, is the source of doctrine, and is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested but also maintains that Ellen G. White had a valid and authoritative prophetic gift. Such statements may or may not sound all right in the abstract, but how or should a body of believers relate the authority of a modern prophet to the authority of the ancient prophets, canonized in the 66 books of the Bible? It is a topic that has occupied Adventist thinkers across the 160 years of their church history. In fact, it is not too much to say that seventh, the Seventh-day Adventist movement was formed in the matrix of tension on the subject of visions versus the Word. On the one hand, Millerite Adventism had gone on record in June 1843 that we have no confidence whatsoever in any visions, dreams, or private revelations. That sentiment was reaffirmed in May 1845 by the Millerites, some seven months after the Great Disappointment. Millerite Adventism rejected authoritative modern visions. Millerite Adventism was a movement of one authoritative book only. And that was the Bible. One of Seventh-day Adventism's other theological roots had the same position on the authority of the Bible, and that is the Christian connection. The connection was a restorationist group. Now, restorationism basically means that all of the lost doctrines of the New Testament that were lost during the Middle Ages would be restored before Jesus comes again. So this is the Christian connection position. The Christian connection held to the Bible as its only rule of faith. Their major theologian, William Kincaid, wrote in 1829 that he had in his early years refused to call himself by any name but that of Christian and that he would take no book for his standard but 
the Bible. Kincaid was certainly clear on the supreme authority of the Bible in religious matters. However, in his extended discussion of the restoration of the ancient order of things, he claimed that he could not settle for one inch short of the New Testament order. And at the center of the New Testament order, he argued, were the spiritual gifts, including the gift of prophecy set forth in such places as 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4. The presence of spiritual gifts in the church, Kincaid wrote, is the ancient order of things. Everyone opposed to this is opposed to New Testament Christianity. To say God caused these gifts to cease is the same as to say that God has abolished the order of the New Testament church. These gifts constitute the ancient order of things. They were not temporary gifts that ceased with the apostolic age. Rather, these gifts, as they are laid down in Scripture, compose the gospel ministry as set forth in the New Testament. Kincaid's New Testament theology of the perpetuity of spiritual gifts in the context of the Bible as the only source of authority is important for understanding early Seventh-day Adventists because two of our three founders came from the Christian connection. Joseph Bates is a leading layman and James White is a connectionist pastor. In short, they had come into Adventism from a movement in which the most influential theologian held to both the Bible and the Bible only as a determiner of faith and practice, but also for the continuation of spiritual gifts, including prophecy, throughout the Christian era. Kincaid did not seem to be concerned with the possible conflict between the two realms of authority. So in a nutshell, while these pioneers from the Christian connection believed that prophecy was of Old and the New Testament, they also believed that God can continue to speak to his people through visions and dreams. The Millerites did not. Millerite Adventists did not. There is no reason why God may not show the past, present, and future fulfillment of his word in these last days by dreams and visions according to Peter's testimony. True visions are given to lead us to God and his written word. But those that are given for a new rule of faith and practice separate from the Bible cannot be from God and should be rejected. He's talking about Smith there. In White's statement, we see the delicate balance followed by several early Adventist thought leaders. The central idea is that the Bible is supreme but that the Bible indicates that God would send visions and spiritual gifts during the last days of Earth's history to guide his people back to the Bible and through the shoals of end-time crisis. Thus, James White points out that Peter's use of Joel 2 in his Pentecost sermon did not exhaust the fulfillment of that prophecy. God would send his Holy Spirit again at the end of time, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and see visions before the second advent. White also quoted 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul says, Despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. James White and early, other early leaders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church had no doubt that the Bible taught that God would pour out the prophetic gift during the last days, and that individuals had a responsibility to test by the Bible criteria those who claimed to be prophets. Adventist leaders also had no doubt that any such gifts must be subordinate to the Bible in the life of believers, and that whenever they were not subordinated, they were being wrongly used. Thus, James could write in 1851 that the gifts of the Spirit should have their proper place. The Bible is an everlasting rock. It is our rule of faith and practice. He went on to assert that if all Christians were as diligent and honest as they should be, they would be able to learn their whole duty from the Bible itself. But, James noted, as the reverse exists and never has existed, 
God in much mercy has pitied the weakness of his people and has set the gifts in the gospel church to correct our errors and to lead us to his living word. Paul says that they are for the perfecting of the saints till we all come in the unity of the faith, Ephesians 4. The extreme necessity of the church, said James, in its imperfect state is God's opportunity to manifest the gifts of his spirit. Every Christian is therefore in duty bound to take the Bible as a perfect rule of faith and duty. He should pray fervently to be aided by the Holy Spirit in searching the scriptures for the whole truth and for his whole duty. He is not at liberty to turn from them to learn his duty through any of the gifts. We say that the very moment he does, he places the gifts in the wrong place and takes an extremely dangerous position. The word should be in front. And the eye of the church should be placed upon it as the rule to walk by and the fountain of wisdom for which to learn duty in all good works. But if a portion of the church err from the truths of the Bible and become weak and sickly and the flock becomes scattered so that it seems necessary for God to employ the gifts of the Spirit to correct, to correct revive, and heal the erring, we should let him work. End quote. In a similar vein, in 1868, James White cautioned the believers to let the gifts have their proper place in the church. God has never set them in the very front and commanded us to look to them to lead us in the path of truth and the way to heaven. His word is he magnified. The scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments are man's light, lamp to light up his path to the kingdom. Follow that. But if you err from Bible truth and are in danger of being lost, it may be that God will in the time of his choice correct you through the gifts and bring you back to the Bible. End quote. At this juncture, it is important to recognize that just because the early Adventist leaders believed that Ellen White's gift of prophecy was subordinate to the authority of the Bible, that did not mean that they held her inspiration to be of a lesser quality than that of the Bible writers. To the contrary, they believed that the same voice of authority that spoke through the Bible prophets also communicated through her. We find a careful balance here. Even though early Adventists viewed her inspiration as being equally divine in origin with that of the Bible writers, they did not see her as being the same in authority. Let us explore that thought. The early church believed that she was as equally inspired as the Bible writers, but she did not have the same authority as the Bible writers. Can that be explained today? Well, for example, a modern day preacher like your pastor is having a series of evangelistic meetings and prayer is being offered for him. By whose inspiration would you say he speaks under? The same Holy Spirit who directed the men of old. But do you say that he has the same authority? No. However, if he speaks directly from the Bible and quotes the scripture, that scripture has the same authority upon those who listen to him. So there is a difference between being inspired by the Holy Spirit and having the same authority as those of the Bible who were inspired by the same spirit. Ellen White and her fellow Adventists held that her authority was derived from the Bible and thus could never be equal to it. As a result, her authority was not to transcend or contradict the boundaries of truth set forth in the Bible. As Ellen White so aptly put it in 1871, I quote, the written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed in the Bible. Ellen White's understanding of the gift harmonized with that of her husband. Thus, in 1851, she could write in the conclusion to her first little book, and I quote, I recommend to you, dear friend, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. God has, in that word, promised to give visions in the last days. 
not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth, end quote. It is important to realize that Ellen White believed that her visions were for the guidance of the Adventist community rather than the Christian church at large. Writing to Adventist believers in 1871, she noted, If you had made God's word your study with a desire to reach the Bible standard, you would not have needed the testimonies. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourself with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple, direct testimonies, calling your attention to the words of inspiration which you had neglected to obey and urging you to fashion your lives in accordance with its pure, elevated teachings. End quote. Did you hear that? that she believed that her visions were for the Advent community and not the Christian church at large. Have mercy. The theoretical statements on the relation of the authority of the Bible to that of Ellen White were quite consistent. But we need to ask, did the early Adventists practice what they preached on the topic? More specifically, did Ellen White's visions have a significant role in doctrinal formation, and how did her writings relate to the interpretation of the Bible? The second point is the most easily addressed. Since the, in the first decades of Adventism, Ellen White's writings were not thought of as interpreting the meaning of Scripture. As to doctrinal formation, James White wrote in 1855 that it should be understood that all these views as held by the body of Sabbath keepers were brought out from the scriptures before Mrs. W. had any view in regard to them. These sentiments are founded upon the scriptures as their only basis. My gentle people, did you hear this again? The doctrines were through the study of the men, and Ellen White had no input into them. So how do we get to attaching her words to every interpretation of Scripture as though God gave her this and nothing else could be accepted? Listen further. In my history of Adventist theology called A Search for Identity, you'll discover that all of our doctrines, not one of them, came from Ellen White. Oh, I love to hear that. So the practice on tithes and offerings came from whom? The doctrines on health reform, if that is a doctrine, came from whom? So they can be challenged in the very same way that they were formed, through the word of God, by the word of God. Nothing is wrong in that. So he's asking, did we say that in theory, but practice the opposite? Like one teaching grace, but emphasizes law? Think about that. Listen to this carefully. From James White is found in the context of a discussion of, a discussion of Seventh Day Adventist doctrine being a vision view rather than a Bible view. That accusation was a popular one among the denomination's detractors, especially one Miles Grant, who argued in 1874 in the World's Crisis, that's a First Day Adventist public, publication, that the Sabbatarians' understanding of the heavenly sanctuary doctrine had come through Ellen White's visions. I already noted this quotation, but I'm going to read it again because I want to comment on it. Uriah Smith, this is 30 years after the Great Disappointment. Uriah Smith responded, 1874, hundreds of articles have been written upon the subject of the sanctuary, but in no one of these are the visions once referred to as any authority on the subject or the source from whence any view we hold has been derived. Nor does any preacher ever refer to them on this question. The appeal is invariably to the Bible, where there is abundant evidence for the views we hold on this subject. Now, it is one thing to make such a claim as Uriah Smith did, while it is quite another to substantiate them. Were they true claims? The interesting thing about Smith's assertion that not one time 
in those 30 years did we rely upon Ellen White to substantiate our sanctuary position. The interesting thing about that assertion is that any person, including yourself, willing to go back into early Seventh-day Adventist literature can either verify or disprove Smith's statement. On the subject of the heavenly sanctuary, Paul Gordon has done just that, verifying Smith's claim in the sanctuary 1844 and the pioneers on a broader scale. Extensive research by Merlin Burt, Rolf J. Perler, and myself has demonstrated that Adventism's various doctrines were originated and fleshed out by several individuals, none of whom became Seventh-day Adventist. The Adventist contribution was the integrating of the various doctrines they had accepted through Bible study into an apocalyptic theology that we call the Great Controversy. But even the Great Controversy theology was not a development by Ellen White. It was developed by Joseph Bates studying the book of Revelation. Ellen White's early visions tended to be visions of confirmation, of Bible study, or related to building unity in matters of detail. Early Seventh-day Adventists appear to have been a people of one book. They seem to have been consistent in theory and practice in their view of the Bible as the only source of doctrinal authority and their acceptance of a modern prophet. But that would change. You can rewind to fully understand what he is saying, but in essence, there is proof that the early church did not develop its doctrines through Ellen White. Her visions qualified their findings and also based on behaviors. But with a smile, he says, but that would change. I will say right here that you can go through the early decades of the Review and Herald, our publication, or for that matter, the signs of the times, but it's much later, and you will not find them quoting Ellen White for authority. Period. Hear that. You can go through the early um, decades and you will not find them quoting Ellen G. White for authority. Imagine that. So here we have it, that even Ellen White herself begged that we prove everything from Scripture. But here it is that no matter how I try to engage this practice, I hear the servant of the Lord says, or oh, God has spoken through the prophet and we must not go against that. That brings us to the 1888 era. The transformation in Adventism's usage of Ellen White's writings in relation to the Bible cannot be pinpointed with complete accuracy. It may have begun in the late 1870s but it is openly evident in the 1880s. That was particularly true as the denomination approached its 1888 General Conference session. That session would be one of the most significant in Adventist history. At stake was the understanding of the gospel and law and how they should be related. Side topics were the definition of the law in Galatians and the Ten Horns of Daniel 7. In the struggle over the various topics, questions of a religious authority, that is, how do you solve your theological and biblical issues, came to the front front, forefront. Swerving from the earlier Adventist position on the absolute primacy of the Bible, the denomination's second generation leadership sought to solve their theological and biblical issues through their use of human authority related to expert opinion, authoritative position, Adventist tradition, and majority votes. The reforming element, that is Jones, Wagner, and James, uh, uh, excuse me, Willie and Ellen White. The reforming element that was pushing for a more Christ-centered theology rejected all appeals to human authority in solving theological and biblical issues. Ellen White, the only remaining founder of the denomination, stood firmly with the Reformers in their belief in the primacy of Scripture. But the, the, the official leadership of the denomination not only sought to use human authority to shore up what they saw as threats to traditional Adventist theology, but also they sought to use the authority of Ellen White. 
In the eyes of the General Conference President, George I. Butler, an authoritative word from the pen of Ellen White would solve both the biblical and the theological issues facing the church. Butler and his colleagues took two approaches to having Ellen White solve the theological biblical issues. The first was to have her provide a written statement on the controverted topics related to the interpretation of Galatians and the Ten Horns of Daniel. Between June 1886 and October 1888, the embattled General Conference President wrote Ellen White a series of more than a dozen letters requesting and at times demanding that she use her authority to settle the controversial issues. Significantly, Ellen White refused to let Butler and his colleagues use her writings to settle the theological biblical issues dividing the church. She even went so far as to tell the delegates at the General Conference session in 1888 that it was providential that she had lost the one writing in which she had purportedly identified the law in Galatians. Now, you've got to realize Ellen White standing before the general conference in session saying, it's God's will that I lost my testimony. I quote, God has a purpose in this. He wants us to go to the Bible and get scripture evidence. In other words, Ellen White rejected the position of Butler and others that sought to use her writings as an inspired commentary on Scripture. The second strategy of Butler, the Butler Coalition in the 1888 era, was to use Ellen White's published writings to establish the correct interpretation of the controverted issues. In regard to the interpretation of the law in Galatians, for example, they quoted from her sketches from the life of Paul, to arrive at the correct understanding. Once again, she rejected their maneuver, asserting, and I quote, I cannot take my position on either side until I have studied the question, end quote. She was not willing to let her writings be used to settle the interpretive issue. For her, Scripture was supreme. While her writings might be used to apply scriptural principles to her context, they were not to be used authoritatively to give the final word on the meaning of scripture. And to make sure that her writings would not be used improperly to solve the particular issue on the law in Galatians, she had the quotations on the law in Galatians removed when she revised the book some years later. No one and I emphasize again, no one pounded home the primacy of Scripture principle more vigorously and more often during the 1888 era of Adventist history than Ellen White. We want, she wrote, Bible evidence for every point we advance. April 1887, July 1888, the Bible is the only rule of faith and doctrine. And in August, she wrote to all the delegates of the forthcoming General Conference session that the Word of God is the great detector of error. To it, we believe, everything must be brought. The Bible must be our standard for every doctrine and practice. We are to receive no one's opinion without comparing it to the Scriptures. Here is divine authority, which is supreme in matters of faith. It is the Word of the living God that is to decide all controversies, end quote. The struggle over the authority at the 1888 meetings was apparently, had apparently made an impression on the denomination's ministry. W.C. White wrote at the end of the general conference session that many go forth from this meeting determined to study the Bible as never before. The lessons on religious authority related to the 1888 general conference session are crucial for evaluating the authority of the Bible in relation to the prophetic authority in Seventh-day Adventism. Ellen White herself had held the position of early Adventism, but many of the second-generation leaders and ministers had moved from that well-defined position and had sought to use Ellen White's prophetic authority to settle theological and exegetical 
issues. Did you hear that? That the next generation of Adventists sought Ellen White to solve theological and exegetical issues in the church. Are you taking notes? This is the heart of the issue, that Adventists now take Ellen White's writing as this infallible prophetic writings that no one should criticize or challenge. With that understanding, you can see how the book, Desire of Ages and Great Controversy, cannot and should not be viewed as some infallible book written under inspiration, like how God spoke to Isaiah, but that from her own lips, she said she borrowed extensively from other materials and did not give their citations because they were not the focus. So the issue is not at Ellen White much, but at believers. So once I point out these things, I am literally caught off. Nobody wants to hear me because I'm attacking the foundation of the church. If the writings of Ellen White is the foundation of the church, then the church is as cultish as the Mormons. Remember these words from George Knight? I'm not a leading voice, but I, as insignificant as I may be, the truth remains the same. The word of God has to be re-examined as often as we can to see if we are satisfying or saying what scripture is saying and not what another person is saying. So while in my understanding I can say that this does not line up with scripture to another, this is sacrilegious because you have violated the sanctity of the prophet to the church. Every pastor, leader, now member is duped in this cultish web of Ellen White that the only way to show spirituality and Adventism is to constantly quote from Ellen White for every subject under the sun and all theology. Those who advocated the older interpretation held that the new one would subvert the denomination's theology because a statement in Ellen White's writings supported the traditional Adventist interpretation. In other words, you can't change the interpretation of the daily because Ellen White identified it in early writings. S.N. Haskell, the leader of those who were advocating the older interpretation, argued that to make any change in the established position would undermine Mrs. White's authority. He was quite explicit on his views on the relationship of her writings to the Bible. I quote from Haskell, We ought to understand such expressions by the aid of the spirit of prophecy. For this purpose, the spirit of prophecy comes to us. All points are to be solved by reference to Ellen White. Ellen White was still alive. She disagreed with the argument, requesting that her writings, and I quote, not be used, end quote, to settle the issue. I entreat of Elder Haskell Jones, excuse me, of Elders Haskell, Loughborough, Smith, and others of our leading brethren that they make no reference to my writings to sustain their views on the daily. I cannot consent that any of my writings shall be taken as settling this matter. Thus, in both the struggles over the daily and the law in Galatians, Ellen White took the position that her comments were not to be used as if she were an infallible commentator to settle the meaning of the Bible. W.C. White also provides us with an interesting insight into the issue of his mother's relationship to the Bible, and I quote, Some of our brethren are much surprised and disappointed because mother does not write something decisive that will settle the question as to what is the daily and thus bring an end to the present disagreement. At times I had hope for this, but as I have seen that God has not seen fit to settle the matter by a revelation through his messenger, I have come more and more to believe that it was the will of God that a thorough study should be made of the Bible and history till a clear understanding of the truth was gained, end quote. Ellen White's refusal to function as an infallible Bible commentator should not have surprised anyone. She had not assumed that role in the past, but had always pointed to their need to study the Bible for themselves. Never did she take the position that you must let me tell you what the Bible really means. Never. Hear that? Never. I hope those who challenge me on this issue get to listen to this for themselves. We perish for lack of knowledge. I hope they would be mature enough to voice their apologies the same way they voice their condemnations. But unfortunately, they will have nothing to say. It's just 
the way life goes. In spite of Ellen White's clarity in the topic, the battle over the identity of the daily rumbled along for more than two decades. The topic of the daily itself wasn't all that crucial. The real issue was Ellen White's authority as a divine commentator on Scripture. Such titles as the little pamphlet, Have We an Infallible Spirit of Prophecy? reflects the sentiments of those who were so concerned with the topic that in 1922 they utilized the issue of Ellen White's authority to overthrow Arthur G. Daniels, who had been president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists for 21 years because he didn't believe that Ellen White should be used as a divine commentator. The authoritative role of Ellen White was not just a preoccupation with the denominator's, denominational's dissidents. Leaders at the center of the church also espoused this position. Thus, F.M. Wilcox, influential editor of the Denominations Review and Herald, can claim in 1921 that her writings, and I quote, constitute a spiritual commentator, commentary on the scriptures, end quote. And in 1946, Wilcox asserted before the General Conference session that Ellen White's writings were far above all other commentaries because they were inspired commentaries motivated by the promptings of the Holy Spirit. The one who fails to make this distinction reveals that he has little of any faith in the doctrine of spiritual gifts and their application to the church today. By mid-century... The Wilcox position had become by far the dominant one in Seventh-day Adventism, so much so that the extensive Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary published between 1953 and 1957 had a section for unpublished and out-of-print Ellen White remarks at the end of each volume and a list of references to her published uses of various texts after the discussion of each biblical chapter. That very arrangement led people to see her writings more than ever as a divine inspired commentary on Scripture. This is so true. As the pastors are reminded that no matter what Bible commentary they use, they must finally go to the SDA Bible commentary when preaching on the pulpit, which is also loaded with Ellen White. So the whole church, from commentary to manual to quarterly studies, to, are bombarded with the infallible writings. One lady reported to me that years ago, the church enjoyed Bible study every Sabbath. They had the desire of ages, a great controversy, preparation for the final crisis and the Bible. My response to her was, can you hear yourself? A Bible study and you have all these books. That is not a Bible study, it is indoctrination. So when Adventists are fed this way, all their sinews and, and bones are nourished by Ellen White. So to wean them off that mentality is to take away from them the Adventist identity and even their Christianity to the extent that some SDAs label themselves no other way but Adventists. This holds more weight. Some believe that if you don't accept the writings of Ellen White, as I said, you can't be saved. I kid you not. So immediately those who begin to stick to the Bible only find themselves drifting away from the beliefs that cannot be supported by Scripture. As to the authority of the Bible, she continued to hold the position that the Adventist pioneers had inherited from the William Kincaid Christian Connection tradition. In his word, she wrote in 1911, God has committed to men the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of His will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of every experience. The Spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible. For the Scriptures explicitly state that the Word of God is a standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. I feel so vindicated. When I tried to explain these very facts, I did not know that this lecture existed. I thank God that it is proven historically that I am right. So you know my voice will be louder. I am now going to ask you the question. Are you ready to share this to as many people as you can so that they can be liberated from the cloud that is over them? These pious ones who, who cannot accept the simple word of God but must be seen as 
extra holy because every minute they can break out into the servant of the Lord says in every conversation, every sermon, etc. No pastor who gives you an ultimatum about your belief in the gift of prophecy in the person of Ellen White understands this and needs to go back to the drawing board and get his facts straight. Remember, I promise to stand even if I have to stand alone. This little voice crying out in the wilderness will be a clarion call tomorrow. Pastors will be brave enough to stand on this premise of the Bible and the Bible only and thus will agree with free conscience that these things I show you are indeed biblically correct. You wait and see. She went on, as Kincaid and the early Adventist leaders had, to indicate that, and I quote, after the close of the canon of Scripture, the Holy Spirit still continued his rightful work. And that, of course, included the gift of prophecy until the Advent itself. Others may have drifted from the position of early Adventism on the authority of Ellen White in relation to the Bible, but she appears to have kept on her course. And she was not the only one. The denomination's 1919 Bible Conference of Church Administrators and Religious Religion Teachers is remarkable for its openness on the topic. C.L. Benson, for example, pointed out disapprovingly that many Adventists put more emphasis on Ellen White's writings than the Bible. And A.G. Daniels, the denomination's president, was much, was much closer to James and Ellen White and the other pioneers of the Seventh-day Advent, uh, uh, Seventh Adventist Church than, the, than he was to some of his contemporaries when he remarked, and I quote, we are to get our interpretation from this book, meaning the Bible, primarily. I think that the book explains itself, and I think we can understand the book fundamentally through the book without resorting to the testimonies to prove up on it. W.E. Howell, education director of the General Conference, noted that the spirit of prophecy says the Bible is the only, as its only, expositor. To that comment, Daniels responded, yes, but I have heard ministers say that the spirit of prophecy is the interpreter of the Bible. I heard it preached at the General Conference some years ago. He's meaning by A.T. Jones, when it was said that the only way we could understand the Bible was through the writings of the spirit of prophecy. Anderson speaks up. He also said, infallible interpreter. Daniels responded by observing that this is not our position. It is not right that the spirit of prophecy is the only safe interpreter of the Bible. That is a false doctrine, a false view. It will not stand. Daniels went on to note correctly that the Adventist pioneers, and I quote, got their knowledge of the Scriptures as they went along through the Scriptures themselves. It pains me to hear the way some people talk, that the spirit of prophecy led out and gave all the instruction, all the doctrines to the pioneers. That is not according to the writings themselves. We are told how they searched these Scriptures together and studied and prayed over them until they got together on them, end quote. He then expressed his dismay at those Adventists, I'm quoting, who will hunt around to find a statement in the testimonies and spend no time in deep study of the Bible, end quote. Adventists spend more time hunting around. And that is exactly what it means, hunting around to find some statement that supports their argument rather than searching the scriptures for what it says. So at the end of the day, they know more about what the servant of the Lord says than what the actual scripture says. Daniel and his colleagues in 1919 may have had a correct position on the relation of Ellen White's writings to the Bible, but their timing could not have been more disastrous. The 1920s would see the fundamentalist crisis over biblical authority reach an explosive climax, and Adventism would be drawn into the vortex of a struggle that for them entailed not only biblical issues, but also issues related to Ellen White's authority. Those who spoke out openly at the 1919 Bible Conference, including the General Conference presidents, would lose their jobs. Meanwhile, the minutes of this very open meeting were purposefully locked up in a vault where they were lost for six decades. The conference was forgotten 
along with the position and authority held by Ellen White and the founders of Seventh-day Adventism. Those who spoke out would lose their jobs. Why was that so? Because a new generation of Adventism was born. The one that solves everything through Ellen White. This is the Adventism that exists today. And quite frankly, that is cultish. So for 60 years, these evidences of that behavior was locked away so that no one would know of what happened. The middle decades of the 20th century found Adventists more and more using Ellen White's writings to both settle biblical issues and to do theology. Few would have openly admitted that they were putting Ellen White's authority above that of the Bible, but their writings and discussions indicated that all too many Adventists, if not most, were spending more time with Ellen White than they were with the Bible. She had, for the most of them, become the final word on any biblical passage that she had utilized, and also she become a doctrinal authority. A word from Ellen White during these decades tended to end discussion. The official position of the denomination may not have changed, but practice certainly had. By the 1960s, the new practices had become firmly entrenched, and it appeared to most Adventists that that, that is how their church had always utilized Ellen White's writings. Between the early 1880s and the late 1990s, the historic pattern of the relationship between Ellen White and the Bible in terms of authority, as outlined earlier in this paper, was becoming more well-known among significant sectors of the leadership, clergy, and reading laity of the denomination. Significantly, in 1981, Robert Olson, director of the Ellen White estate, faced the problems inherent in the infallible commentary approach. He wrote, and I quote, To give an individual complete interpretive control over the Bible would, in effect, elevate that person above the Bible. It would be a mistake to allow even the Apostle Paul to exercise inter interpretive control over all the Bible writers, other Bible writers. In such a case, Paul, and not the whole Bible, would be one's final authority. Olson went on to note that Ellen White's writings are generally homiletical or evangelistic in nature and not strictly exegetical. In fact, she often accommodated the words of a text to her own homiletical needs. Thus, she could derive quite different meanings from the same passage depending on her purpose. Olson does, does note correctly that she sometimes interprets texts exegetically, even though she generally spoke homiletically. But that fact does not imply that she ever claimed to be a divine commentator on Scripture. Did you hear that? homiletical and evangelistic in nature and not strictly exegetical. This statement means that Ellen White's writings were like a preacher giving his comments on scripture homiletically and also like an evangelist who could use a lot of emotions to get a point across. But not exegetically means that she does not and has not been trained in the area of Greek and Hebrew to be able to exegete the scripture the way that uh, a pastor who is trained can do. Ellen White was not trained in this matter, so her writings could not and should not be used in this matter. It is only obvious. In the early 21st century, mainline Adventism has a healthier understanding of the relationship between Ellen White's authority and that of the Bible. Its theologians and biblical interpreters have a better grasp of the biblical position and that of the founders of the Adventist church, including Ellen White herself. In practice, that means that she is neither a determiner of doctrine nor the final word on the meaning of Scripture. But old habits and ways of thinking die hard for some, even when they know the facts. And there are many mainline Adventists who haven't even caught up with the facts yet. But when all is said and done, 
Mainline Adventism is light years ahead of where it was in 1980 in its understanding of Ellen White's authority. The same cannot be said for sectarian Adventism. The perfectionistic, fundamentalistic subdenominations within the larger church still largely rely on Ellen White for their theology and have no problem viewing her as an infallible commentary on Scripture. This sector of Adventism has even developed an Ellen White study Bible that has Ellen White notes and marginal references. Such a Bible would have been totally rejected by both Ellen White and early Adventism. Even though the study Bible is published by an independent group, it is unfortunately marketed by our main denominational publisher. Some years ago, I persuaded the publishing house administration to drop its marketing of the Ellen White Study Bible on the grounds that Ellen White would vigorously object to it from what we know of her principles historically. And they did. They stopped marketing it altogether. But after some years, some months, the publishing house president phoned me up, notifying me that they were reversing their decision because there was a demand for the study Bible and it sells well. So much for higher principles. When he says so much for higher principles, he means so much for integrity. It was not a matter of right and wrong, but because there was a demand for it and it, sell, it sold well. This is the... Bible hymnal that he speaks about. You will find her quotes all over. There is also the clear word. As you would notice, it is not from the church itself, but the church's publishing house printed it and sold them in the ABCs because conferences saw the lucrative business that could be gained. One of these went for a healthy sum. Since it carried both your hymnal and your Bible all zipped up, everyone wanted one, but it was deeper than that. It explained the Bible through Ellen White. We can point a finger at the Jehovah's Witnesses having their own Bible when the SDA uses the mainstream King James Version, but its footnotes are strictly um, Ellen White. Six is half a dozen. I once I was down in Trinidad preaching, and the creator of the Ellen White Study Bible saw me down there, and he says, you're the man that's been causing all the trouble. And I said, I haven't caused nearly as much trouble as I'd like to have caused. Sectarian Adventist groups are critical of mainline Adventism for what they call its betrayal of the prophet and often consider themselves in one form or another to be the true historic Adventists. Unfortunately, their understanding of history focuses on the period from the 1920s through the 1950s and the approach to Ellen White's writings set forth by A.T. Jones in the 1890s. They have failed to capture the biblical understanding of the founders of the denomination, including that of Ellen White herself. One of the tragedies in Adventism for me is that many who claim to be Ellen White's closest followers don't have the foggiest notion on what she stood for, except for certain details that they have an interest in. Now that's deep. That refers to you, you who are ready to chop anyone down who wails on the mountain of the Bible and the Bible only. You don't have the foggiest idea of what Ellen White stood for. Now is the time to take stock, be it pastors, presidents, departmental heads, elders, officers, members. You are promoting a sectarian cultish Adventism, not the one that teaches from the Bible. If and when you do, your eyes will be opened, your scales will fall off and words will have different meanings. Passages will be opened up to you. Your myopic one text, two text dogma will fall away to whole passages with completely different meaning. At the conclusion of this paper presented at Brigham Young, soon to be published by Mercer University Press, we had a question and answer session. And what probably the leading historical theology in Protestant circles of the day stood up and he said, George, we're really not having any problem with Ellen White anymore. I wanted to say, that's funny. The Adventists have come to just the opposite conclusion. 
And then the man sitting next to me, the leading Mormon scholar, looked at me and he said publicly, well, if you Adventists have made it into the evangelical fold with Ellen White, don't you think we can make it with Joseph Smith? And I said, brother, you don't understand the difference between Joseph Smith and Ellen White. The reason was highlighted back in James, with James White back in 1847 when he said that if a prophet gives new teachings that are outside of the biblical realm, he was writing against your prophet. That's the difference between Adventism and Mormonism. But, as I said before, it's easy for an Adventist to be a Mormon. What a way to close that lecture. It is easier for an Adventist to be a Mormon. That may be a strong statement, but he's referring to the present belief of having a prophet and interpreting scripture through that prophet. In conclusion, we see that George Knight brought a full historical journey on how the early church and Ellen White viewed her writings and how the 20th and 21st century Adventists flipped the script. Today, everyone who does not believe in Ellen White or the spirit of prophecy or that Ellen White is the continuing source of inspiration and authority and her writings help young theologians to understand the Bible will be on the wrong side of the fence. Not that you don't believe Ellen White, but you don't use her. This creates such a web for the church that anyone who does the right thing by visiting and revisiting the word of God is met with stark opposition and condemned as a heretic. This leaves everyone else under the yoke of take this or leave it. This is what we believe, so if you have a problem, find another church. It's not, you know, we were unaware that this is what we were doing. Let's try to make that change. A most dangerous position for a Christian to hold. I thank God that someone has already done the work so that I don't have to do it. And you should thank God that someone has brought it to you, that you yourself don't have to do it. So where do we go from here? Begin to read your Bible and use the proper tools to understand it. Pray for the understanding by the Holy Spirit and he will lead you. If anyone says something that is new, ask them to prove it from the scripture. Let them allow you to analyze it within the word itself. So based on our studies, my departing word is that Adventism or the Adventist church has violated and is violating the very principle that it set up, the Bible and the Bible only. The time has come to wake up and do right. The time has come to go back to the Bible, to let the words speak to you and not speak to it. Consider this a clarion call. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you love all your children and that is all your children. We know that you want us to be saved. We thank you for the clarity of your word written in the commonest language. Just like Jesus was born of lowly birth, your word was written for all to understand. Help us to go to its pages and find the truth therein. May we see you high and lifted up in these words. And may we pattern ourselves after your word. Bless us now and allow your truth to prevail in these times we pray. For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. And if you have been enlightened, feel free to share with someone who needs to know this. And you can subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do so, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God.